What breaks your heart? I don't want to take all of us to a dark place this morning, but I want to invite you to join me in, in thinking openly and honestly about those things that, that just break your heart, that tear you apart. They're personal things, they're individual, and they're unique to each one of us. I think about the gospel lesson this morning and Jairus' daughter. We don't have her name, but we know he knew her name. We know Jesus knew her name. We, knew, we know her friends knew her name. And as she was sick and as things were declining, we can only imagine how all of those who loved her so much were having their heart broken again and again. The unnamed woman who is the recipient of the first healing miracle in Mark, certainly knew the feeling of heartbreak after she went year after year of hoping, praying, pleading, trying to find something to heal what was going on inside of her. For us, what is it? What breaks our hearts? Is it seeing someone in pain? either physical or emotional. Maybe some folks who are wearing brightly colored t-shirts know the, the pain of heartbreak, of riding what, to what seems like the top of the hill only to see that you're in Virginia and there's just another one. <laughs> this isn't Indiana. Sorry. Heartbreak can be funny when it's not your own because I've been there and have openly wept at seeing, for me, it was running and thinking that I was at the top of the hill and going, oh no. But heartbreak can come in cruelty. Seeing hatred, images of mindless suffering, maybe the loss of a, a loved one or a friend. My extended family, we've lost two of the last of my grandmother's generation just in the past week. My parents, in just a little while, will be on their way to Michigan to go and celebrate the lives of these two saints who weren't part of the same strain of the family, but just happened to go to be with God within days of one another. Losing a loved one can be truly devastating, especially a spouse or a parent or what no parent should have to go through. What Jairus' father or Jairus was, was looking at and with his daughter, but the heartbreak of losing a child. Each of these examples is, is individual and it affects a small number of people. But what about those big things that impact millions of lives? Poverty, devastation, wars, polarization and politicization of everything. What about pollution? Those videos of plastic in the ocean seem to be everywhere right now. And as a former diving instructor, a scuba diving instructor, I see the dead wildlife and inexplicably will find myself getting torn up over these sea creatures dying. Sometimes grief can sneak up on us and can surprise us. We, we think we're over something. I know for a fact of instances where a long divorced couple, a divorced couple who went through a bitter and gut-wrenching divorce, then one hears that the other has passed away and inexplicably suddenly has this feeling of grief, never having anticipated it. And if we've reached in our minds as we've gone through all of these different examples of heartbreak, a place of being able to imagine and visualize grief, we're at a point where we can see our Old Testament lesson. We're, we're at a point where we can see the world just a little bit through David's eyes. For David, the death of King Saul and Saul's son Jonathan broke his heart. In this reading that you just heard, we encounter David in mourning. 2 Samuel isn't one of those books that people get excited about reading or preaching about. 
It's one of those books that seems to fit into a blur. Maybe at some point some of you memorized it, where it falls in the order, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and so on. And that's kind of it. The Sunday school superstars will maybe remember it falls into this category of historical books. But what else? Knowing a little bit about 1st and 2nd Samuel can help us understand why David's grief in this story is complicated. There's more to it than just hearing about the death of Saul and singing a song of lament. Most scholars treat 1st and 2nd Samuel as one book. And it tells the story that Israel remembers of making a transition. It's important to to recognize that even though it falls into this category we call historical books, it's not a historiography, it's not what someone from grounds did with their Guggenheim Fellowship to be published by some university press. This is God's story, and so the point is always going to work back to being theological. And so this is ancient Israel's memory of making the transition from being a tribal society to being a monarchy, from being fraught with anarchy and cruelty and savagery to bureaucratic visions of self-aggrandizement. And this is part of ancient Israel's self-understanding. First and second Samuel focuses on several key characters And it's the story of the careers of these characters. First you have Samuel, and then Saul, and then David. And taking a wide angle before we get into the lament can help us understand why this is important and what it says to us today. Samuel was a priest, and he was the last of God's judges. He was unable to defeat the Philistines. He was the kingmaker who anointed Saul and later David, and he was the kingbreaker when God decided that Saul was no longer supposed to be the king. So that's Samuel. Saul is this tragic character. Because God chose him. Samuel anointed him. Saul did God's work. He defeated the Ammonites. And then he defeated the Amalekites. But then Saul, and we can look at this another time, but he decided to show mercy on the king of the Amalekites. That's not what God told him to do. Again, that's uh, something to wrestle with another day, but it helps us to understand the tragedy of who King Saul was. So God turned on him, and in response, Saul descended into madness. Well, who is this David character? I think we all know David. Oh, that shepherd boy done good. Anointed by Samuel. While Saul was still king. David showed up at one of those great battles with the Philistines and saw that they were up against the Philistine giant Goliath. And we know how that went. David slew Goliath. But David and Saul had a complicated relationship. Samuel had anointed David to be king. Problem was there still was a king. David's buddy, Saul, And as Saul felt that desolation of God moving away, he went crazy. He tried to kill David, and yet David remained true. He married Michelle, which made him part of Saul's family. This is one of Saul's daughters. Saul's son, Jonathan, was such a close friend that he even interceded on David's behalf on another occasion when Saul decided to kill him. Saul is completely separated from God at this point, at the end of 1 Samuel. And so he consults with a medium, a fortune teller, who calls up the spirit of the now departed Samuel. And Saul learns that he's going to lose a battle. He's going to lose his life. And then at the end of the battle, when his sons die, he asks his sword bearer to kill him so that he may not be taken. And the sword bearer cannot do it. So Saul takes his own life. We already know that he's descended into mental illness and the darkness that that carries. 
And now we get to our reading. This is where it begins, where David learns about Saul's death and his, his very close friend Jonathan's death. And when he hears this news, he sings a lament. This is the same Saul that tried to kill him. And now he's crying. He's weeping over this loss. This is the same Saul who did God's work and then fell out of favor. This is the same Saul with this complicated life. I, I like Bible stories that are complicated. We're, we're so... We have such a demand for a clear this or this. A binary decision. It's either this way or that way. And yet we see the ebb and flow of God at work through Samuel and then Saul and now David. The Bible presents us with these stories to tell us something about God. And at this moment, it's not about the theology of Saul's tragic life or Jonathan getting sucked into the vortex of a fallen figure or even David's rise. It's not really about the characters. The story, the one in our reading today, is about grief. It's about sitting down and having a good cry and realizing that God is there with you in the midst of it. God is with you with the difficult, hard things that we don't really have a clear answer for. In Ecclesiastes, we read about a time for everything. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. And, and summer very much seems like the time for dancing. It's a time for celebrating with barbecues, time at, at the pool, going out for a bike ride. It's a time for hiking in the Shenandoah. It's the time, this time of the year is the time for watching fireworks and getting together with friends and celebrating and having a good time. There's so much during summer that, that commends us to, to a time for dancing that we can miss that life also brings times for grieving. And in the midst of all the dancing, Grief can sneak in and sometimes surprise us. Laments are difficult because sometimes we don't have the words. We don't know what to say. And, and that's where this story comes back in and gives us a little bit of a, a nudge. David didn't have the words. He doesn't know what to say. So he picks up a book, a book that has been long lost to history, a book that only has one other reference in the Bible, the book of Jashar, which is referenced in Joshua as well. But this book of Jashar is likely a, a book of hymns or poems. And, and he picks one out as a song of lament. And there are ways to we, we can interpret this song, we can look at it analytically. We could bring in literary analysis, grammatical analysis, textual analysis. The first part is maybe telling the story of a significant figure. Another interpretation could be that they want to teach something to the next generation, like learn the bow, learn military science, just like Saul and Jonathan did. Follow in the best of their footsteps. But we can set that analysis aside. David's lament from the book of Jashar says that it's okay to cry. David could have breathed a sigh of relief at this point. And I can't say I would have blamed him. Thank goodness I don't have that madman trying to kill me anymore. But he didn't. He paused. He focused on the good. He focused on Saul's accomplishments. He gave thanks for Saul's life, the good of Saul's life. And he gave himself the honest space to cry. Grief is honest speech to God. Grief is opening ourselves up and saying to God what we truly feel, what is happening inside. There's a sacredness to tears. They're not the mark of weakness but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 words. Sometimes the Bible gives us great truths to live by. The Sermon on the Mount. Sometimes it tells us about the true nature of God. 
Sometimes it compels us to action and, and can turn cold hearts to compassion for other people. Sometimes scripture is transformative, taking us from where we are to where God wants us to be. This passage is actually all of those things. This passage touches each of those points. The truth is, it's okay to cry, it's okay to grieve. The nature of God is to be present, to be comforting, to be aware, to be empathetic. God cries with us and walks along beside us in our grief. This passage compels us to be honest and to say what we really feel. Cold hearts that have ignored sadness can be transformed by David's tears. We can become open and honest and lifting up of one another, even encouraging one another when we get to what we thought was the top of the hill and we realize it just goes farther up. Do we stay in our grief? Do we let our days be colored by an inky sadness that shapes everything that is to come? Well, I think you, you all keep pedaling, right? Keep going. David did too. He gave himself space to grieve. But then in 2 Samuel chapter 2, the Lord tells David where to go and what to do next. And David follows. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. And when it's time to mourn, slow down. Give yourself that space. Allow yourself the freedom to be able to be open and honest to yourself, to your friends, to God. And when somebody around you is experiencing grief, you get to be that person who handed David the copy of the book of Jashar and said, hey, you might find something in here. You get to be that voice of comfort, that voice of presence, that voice of encouragement. And no matter what happens in our lives, whether we're mourning or whether we're dancing, God is with us. God is right there with us every step of the way. Amen.